June 19, 1953, Sing Sing Prison, New York, 7.20 p.m. Doomed lovers, convicted of conspiracy to commit espionage, are given a few moments to say goodbye. Husband and wife touch fingers to lips, then press through a mesh screen until their fingers touch. It is their final kiss. Within an hour, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg are electrocuted for passing the secrets of the atomic bomb to the Soviet Union. They are the only Americans to receive the death penalty for espionage outside a military court. Millions around the world are stunned. Many are convinced the government killed the wrong people. The year is 1951. The Second World War is over and America is enjoying prosperity. The baby boom is well underway and the country is busy building steel plants, new homes, highways, and backyard bomb shelters. As the winds of Cold War move in from the east, the Soviet Union, America's World War II ally, becomes its arch enemy. The United States faces a new threat, communism. People were seeing communists under every bed, uh, and uh, we know that it went further than that in the Congress with the House Un-American Activities Committee, which began investigating anybody who had ever uh, had any association with the Communist Party, or the Socialists for that matter. Uh, they were going after every, uh, quote, red in the country. It is an era when everyone is suspect even America's favorite television redhead. Don't bother me with your problems. I got troubles of my own. Lucille Ball, who was unknowingly registered by her grandfather as a communist in 1936, survives the scrutiny. Others in Hollywood are not so lucky. Are you a member of the Communist Party? Ten writers and directors, the so-called Hollywood Ten, are jailed for contempt and blacklisted in the film industry because they refuse to confirm or deny communist affiliations. Stand away from the stand. For Americanism for many years and I shall Stand away from the stand. A nationwide witch hunt begins. The events are as compelling as any movie melodrama. But even Hollywood would have a tough time dreaming up the plot for the incredible spy story that unfolds in New York City in the winter of 1951. The federal courthouse on Foley Square in Lower Manhattan is the setting for this real-life American drama. Courtroom 110 is center stage. The trial begins on Tuesday, March 6th. The whole world is watching as headlines trumpet the government's claim that atomic bomb secrets have been stolen and delivered to the Soviets. FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover calls it the crime of the century. Their goal is the overthrow of our government. There is no doubt as to where a real communist loyalty rests. The primary suspects are Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, an electrical engineer and a housewife, and the parents of two young boys. Morton Sobel, a friend of the Rosenbergs, is their co-defendant. The Rosenbergs are accused of heading up a complex spy ring. Imprisoned, Julius and Ethel deny the charges and long to return to their everyday lives. Darling, we mustn't lose each other or the children. Mustn't lose our identities. All my thoughts are constantly of you and the children and how we spent our time together. Please write me as soon as you can. I love you, Ethel. Love, more love, and hope. Julius. Born in New York City in 1918, Julius Rosenberg is the son of poor Polish immigrants 
and lives with his family on Manhattan's Lower East Side. Ethel Greenglass is born in 1915 and grows up in the same neighborhood. She lives with her parents and three brothers in a cold water tenement. Julius and Ethel attend the same religious school and then Seward Park High School. Julius aspires to be a rabbi, while Ethel's dream of escape is the stage. She appears in school plays and becomes the star of an amateur theatrical group. Their ambitions shift dramatically amidst the economic chaos of the Great Depression in the 1930s. Like many Americans disillusioned by mass unemployment and bread lines, they embrace left-wing politics. The appeal of socialism for young people during the Depression was that this was a time when uh, so many of them had lost faith in the American system and in the possibilities of it supplying a decent life for people. And in addition to that, it was a time when there was tremendous fear internationally of fascism in Italy and Nazism in Germany. And it seemed as if the new dark ages might be coming upon us. In 1934, Julius Rosenberg enrolls at the City College of New York. He studies electrical engineering and develops a passion for radicalism, joining the Steinmetz Club, the campus branch of the Young Communist League. There, he meets Morton Sobel. I met Julius within the context of the Steinmetz Club because Julius was one year junior to me, so we never had any classes together. And so at that time, our, our, our connection was purely uh, political. By 1935, Ethel Greenglass, too, has discovered the Young Communist League, an exciting new stage for her beliefs. On New Year's Eve, she sings at a union fundraising party and meets Julius Rosenberg. They soon fall in love and become inseparable, completely committed to each other and to radical politics. Julius and Ethel are married in June of 1939. It is just two months before the beginning of World War II. The following year, the Rosenbergs move into a new apartment, not far from their childhood homes. Julius, now a member of the Communist Party, is hired as a civilian employee of the U.S. Army Signal Corps. The government job exempts him from the draft. The Rosenberg's first son, Michael, is born in 1943. Four years later, they have a second child, Robert. I was slightly past my third birthday when they were arrested, and I really don't have specific memories. What I do have is a general sense of a happy family. As the summer of 1943 comes to a close, the Rosenbergs suddenly become less social. They stop their openly communist activities, and their subscription to the Daily Worker, the Communist Party newspaper, is canceled. Two years later, in March of 1945, Julius is fired from the Signal Corps. He is accused of being a communist. The Rosenbergs protest the charge, not realizing they are on their way from lower middle class obscurity to international notoriety. The year is 1944. While America is at war against Germany and Japan, the Rosenbergs are living what appears to be a quiet family life. Their public support of the Communist Party has mysteriously stopped, even though the Soviet Union is America's wartime ally. Even conservative figures like General Douglas MacArthur and Winston Churchill praise the Soviets' heroic efforts against Nazi forces. This soon changes with the dawn of the nuclear age. In the desert in Los Alamos, New Mexico, Allied scientists race to split the atom and develop a bomb. The Manhattan Project is the name given to the top-secret atomic effort. Following Germany's surrender in August of 1945, the United States drops two atom bombs on Japan, first at Hiroshima, then at Nagasaki. More than 100,000 people are killed. Japan surrenders, ending World War II. America is now the most powerful nation on Earth, primarily because it holds the secret to the world's deadliest weapon. 
Four years later, the balance of power shifts dramatically when the Soviet Union detonates an atomic bomb in Siberia. The shock waves head west. Truman's dramatic announcement that Russia had the atom secret caused State Departments all over the world to stir at the United Has America's Soviet atomic Secretary secret been stolen? The United States thinks so, and FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover is personally committed to catching the thieves. The suspicion of the Soviet Union was deep-seated in America, uh, and uh, J. Edgar Hoover was the hero, the leader, and the man on the white horse who was uh, ferreting out these spies and was protecting us against this uh, dire threat. His name, Klaus Fuchs. Designation, traitor. In February 1950, suspected spy Klaus Fuchs, a physicist who escaped Nazi Germany and later worked on the Manhattan Project, is arrested in England. He confesses that during the war, he gave information to the Soviets about the top secret project. A week later, Wisconsin Senator Joseph McCarthy makes headlines by charging the State Department has been infiltrated by over 200 communist agents. When McCarthy got on top of this and went after uh, these spies in the State Department in a clearly demagogic way, we had this accelerating centrifuge of suspicion and doubt about the entire uh, stability of uh, the American people. The arrest of Klaus Fuchs ignites the chain of investigations that will lead the FBI to the Rosenbergs. It begins with Fuchs telling British authorities that he passed information on the design of the atomic bomb to an American agent working for the Soviets in 1945. In the United States, the FBI identifies that agent as Philadelphia chemist Harry Gold. Gold tells authorities about a soldier stationed in Los Alamos who gave him additional information about the atomic bomb. On June 15, 1950, David Greenglass, Ethel Rosenberg's younger brother, is questioned by FBI officials. He admits to being the soldier who passed the top secret information to Gold. Greenglass panics and strikes a deal. He identifies his wife, Ruth, and his brother-in-law, Julius Rosenberg, as members of the Soviet spy ring. He realized that if he didn't cooperate, not only could he have also gotten a death sentence and wound up the same way, his wife would have been indicted also because part of the deal he struck was that his wife, Ruth, would not be indicted. On the night of July 17, 1950, the FBI shows up at the Rosenberg apartment. Two agents clap handcuffs on Julius and take him away as his young son, Michael, watches in horror. He is arrested on charges of spying for the Soviet Union. Less than a month after her husband's arrest, Ethel Rosenberg testifies before the grand jury. On her way home, she is arrested. When Ethel was arrested, the FBI knew that she had not been involved in intelligence gathering. However, they wanted to use her as a lever to kind of force Julius to tell anything he might know. As one of the prosecutors expressed it, they wanted to force him to disgorge his information. As the FBI closes in on the Rosenbergs, several of Julius's friends disappear. One of them, Morton Sobel, fearful of a perjury indictment for lying about his membership in the Communist Party, boards a plane with his family from Mexico City. A few weeks later, Sobel is abducted by the Mexican secret police. He is driven to the border and handed over to FBI agents in Laredo, Texas. All I was aware of, something big was happening. I wasn't frightened. I, 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 I somehow, I don't know why, I'm not a brave person, but I, I just, uh, it just is in my nature to get frightened by such a thing. But I knew I had to fight these people. March 6th, 1951. The case of the United States versus Julius Rosenberg, Ethel Rosenberg, and Morton Sobel is called for trial. Each defendant is charged not with espionage or treason, but with the capital crime of conspiracy to commit espionage in wartime. Prosecutors had a strategic reason for going for the indictment which charged conspiracy. They knew that conspiracy requires less evidence than charges of treason or espionage. So they structured this indictment to give themselves the maximum chance of convicting these defendants and getting the death penalty with the least amount of evidence. 
Presiding over the packed courtroom is Judge Irving R. Kaufman. At 40, he is the youngest judge on the federal bench and a native New Yorker. Culled from 300 prospective jurors are 11 men and one woman. The government's team is headed by the United States Attorney for the Southern District of New York, Irving H. Sapol. The 45-year-old prosecutor is ambitious and experienced, having just convicted Commerce Department employee William Remington of perjury for denying he was a communist. His reputation was as a tough prosecutor who was out to get and to nail communists. So that giving Sapol the chief role in this case made it clear that the government was trying to send a message. One of Sapol's assistant prosecutors is 29-year-old James Kilsheimer. Irving Sapol was a fine lawyer. I had worked with him previously on the William Remington case that uh, we had tried. And uh, he was a very stern prosecutor and very uh, well-intentioned. The attorney representing the Rosenbergs is Emanuel Block, who is best known in the legal community for representing trade union and leftist causes. He was way over his head in this case, and I think that Julius and Ethel were uh, ill-served by him, and yet one has to give him credit for having the courage to take this case and to try against all odds to save them, which he sincerely did. Emanuel Block becomes so emotionally involved with the case, he looks after the Rosenbergs' children during their parents' incarceration. If you look at the pictures of my brother and me visiting prison, we're sort of hiding behind him or sort of holding his hand. Somehow, we're relying upon him. He was our advocate, and in fact, he was our legal guardian. Uh, after my parents were executed. It was he who made the determination that we ultimately should uh, live with our adoptive parents, uh, and, and I think it was a very good one. In a series of dawn raids, FBI agents swooped down on communists. In, in a climate of extreme anti-communist paranoia, the jury has been selected in the trial of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg and their co-defendant, Morton Sobel. More than 30 reporters and 150 spectators eagerly await the parade of witnesses promised by the government. Of 23 witnesses who testify, only four directly connect the accused to the alleged conspiracy. The government's first witness is one of those four. Max Elicher is a college classmate of Julius Rosenberg and a longtime friend of Morton Sobel. Like Sobel, he fears a perjury indictment for lying about being a communist when he took his government job. He testifies that between 1944 and 1948, while working as an artillery specialist for the Navy Ordnance Department in Washington, D.C., he was approached by Julius Rosenberg to become a spy. Elicher further testifies about a trip to New York in 1948 to visit Morton Sobel. When he confided to Sobel that he thought he was being tailed by the FBI, Elicher says that Sobel panicked and told him they must deliver some valuable information to Julius Rosenberg that same night. Max Elicher. He said he was tired and he wanted me to go along. He took a 35 millimeter film can. We drove the Catherine Slip. I parked the car facing the East River. He left with the can. I waited. He came back about a half hour later and as we drove off I said, well, what does Julius think about me being followed? He said, don't be concerned about it, it's okay. Max Elicher's story is the only testimony to link Morton Sobel to the Rosenberg's alleged espionage activity. He was just weak. He got caught in a trap. And this is what came out of it. My reaction to it was, uh, uh, in a sense, I felt sorry for him that he had been uh, so weak as to, as to uh, uh, fall into this thing where he had to betray me. The next government witness is not just a friend, he is family. Ethel Rosenberg is visibly shaken when her younger brother, David Greenglass, takes the stand. He's questioned by prosecuting assistant Roy Cohn, whose aggressive style will soon land him a job as an aide to Senator Joseph McCarthy and spawn the career of one of the most controversial lawyers of all time. Backed by his deal with prosecutors, 
Greenglass tells the court that his brother-in-law, Julius Rosenberg, was extremely excited when David was assigned to work at Los Alamos in 1944. David says that Julius asked if he would be willing to provide descriptions of the Manhattan Project, since David was part of a team working on one aspect of the bomb. Smiling nervously, Greenglass further testifies that in January of 1945, while on furlough in New York, he drew a sketch of a high explosive lens mold, the device that helps trigger the atom bomb, and gave it to Rosenberg. According to Greenglass, Rosenberg then told David he would send a courier to New Mexico to pick up more information. He says Rosenberg later cut a jello box in two and gave one half to his wife Ruth. Rosenberg said that whoever he sent to meet the green glasses would produce the matching half. Cohn next questions Green Glass about the meeting in his apartment in Albuquerque with Harry Gold, who turned out to be the courier. David Greenglass. He stepped through the door and said, Julius sent me. And I said, oh, and uh, walked to my wife's purse, took out the wallet and took out the match part of the jello box. He produced his piece and uh, we checked them and they fit it. Greenglass says he gave Gold new sketches of a lens mold and a write-up of the Los Alamos experiment. Cohn then questions Greenglass about a meeting with Julius Rosenberg in September of 1945. David Greenglass. He said to me that he wanted to know what I had for him. I told him, I think I have a pretty good description of the atom bomb. The atom bomb itself? Asks Cohn. That's right. Next up for the prosecution is David Greenglass's wife, Ruth. Although a co-conspirator, she is not a defendant and is never indicted by the government because of her husband's cooperation. Desperate to avoid imprisonment and concerned for her two young children, Ruth supports her husband's story and, in the process, seals the fate of her sister-in-law, Ethel Rosenberg. Ruth tells the court about a night in September 1945 when the Green Glasses delivered David's handwritten report describing the atom bomb to the Rosenbergs. Ruth Greenglass. Well, Ethel was typing the notes and David was helping her when she couldn't make out his handwriting and explained the technical terms and spelled them out for her. Ethel typing the notes was very important and uh, probably the most significant portion of the testimony against uh, <coughs> Ethel and uh, so that, that tied her in lock, stock and barrel into the uh, conspiracy. Thursday, March 15th, Harry Gold, the self-confessed courier for Klaus Fuchs, takes the stand. Gold is currently serving a 30-year sentence for espionage. Gold tells the court that in the spring of 1945, his Soviet contact sent him to New Mexico with one half of a jello box and a piece of paper with the name Green Glass on it. Harry Gold. The last thing that was on the paper was recognition signal. I come from Julius. When it's time to cross-examine Harry Gold, defense attorney Emanuel Block makes a bizarre miscalculation in failing to question the key government witness. This turned out to be the biggest disaster of the trial because the jury believed Harry Gold. They saw Harry Gold as establishing a definite link between Julius Rosenberg and espionage, and the failure to ask him a question made it look like the Rosenberg's counsel was afraid to ask anything because the witness was so strong. Thursday, March 22, 1951. It is day 12 of the Rosenberg trial when the government turns the case over to the defense. The only witnesses called to testify are Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. Ed Kuntz, co-defendant Morton Sobel's lawyer, convinces him not to take the stand because of Sobel's flight to Mexico. Well, my lawyer betrayed me. I thought I had a good chance when I got the stand, but my lawyer was afraid I would be murdered over Mexico. They brought up witnesses from Mexico who showed that I had used uh, as assumed names. This was after Julius was arrested when I traveled around. And, and to, to my lawyer, he was frightened by that testimony. All eyes are on Julius Rosenberg when he takes the stand. The serious-faced suspect is unemotional and his testimony straightforward. Rosenberg calmly maintains his innocence and his long list of dispassionate denials 
does not evoke the sympathy of the jury. Defense attorney Emanuel Block. Did you know of the existence of the Los Alamos Project in December 1944? I did not. Did you ever have any conversation with Mrs. Ruth Greenglass with respect to getting information from David Greenglass out of the place that he was working? I did not. Emanuel Block asks Rosenberg if he ever cut the side of a jello box to use as a recognition signal. Did any such incident ever take place? It never did. When Ethel Rosenberg takes the stand, she too shows no emotion. Her composure is viewed by some as defiance. Many people perceived her as very stern, uh, unbending, tight-lipped, a Soviet soldier. They knew she was a mother, they knew she was a wife, but these things did not loom very large in the course of her testimony and the defense didn't particularly stress it. Like her husband, Ethel says the testimony of her brother and sister-in-law is false. She testifies that she always loved her younger brother, but that the green glasses are simply bitter about money they lost in business with Julius. During cross-examination, Irving Sapol questions Ethel about her relationship with her brother, David. A little while ago, you said that you did everything to help David. Do you remember that? Yes. Did you help him join the Communist Party? I refuse to answer. I refuse to answer on the grounds that I refuse to answer on the grounds that I refuse to answer. It's a response the courtroom has heard time and time again. Throughout their testimony, both Ethel and Julius plead the Fifth Amendment when asked about their involvement in the Communist Party. For the jurors, it simply meant that they were communists, the fact of denying it. And at that time, to be a communist uh, was uh, hardly to be a respectable human being or one worthy of belief or of uh, pity. They hurt themselves, even though they were, the jury was properly instructed to disregard their Fifth Amendment pleas. Uh, it, uh, it hurt them. Wednesday, March 28th, both sides conclude, and the fate of the defendants is now in the hands of the jury. The jury is about to get a case in which the defense lawyer was probably not very effective, and in which the government has built its case on the testimony of three admitted spies who'd cut deals with the government. And even though the judge told the jury to inspect their testimony very carefully, the defense was concerned that a verdict based on their testimony would very likely be unjust. Thursday, March 29th. After nearly nine hours of deliberation, the 12 jurors enter the courtroom. Julius and Ethel Rosenberg stand side by side, their hands touching on the counsel table. The verdict? Guilty of conspiracy to commit espionage. It's now up to Judge Irving R. Kaufman to decide the sentence for the Rosenbergs, Morton Sobel, and David Greenglass. Thursday, April 5th, 1951. The bells of St. Andrew's Church begin to chime on Foley Square. It is noon, and in federal courtroom 110, the Rosenbergs face Judge Kaufman for sentencing. He calls their crime worse than murder and blames them for 50,000 casualties in Korea. Judge Kaufman. Who knows but that millions more innocent people may pay the price of your treason. Indeed, by your betrayal, you undoubtedly have altered the course of history to the disadvantage of our country. The sentence of the court is, you are hereby sentenced to the punishment of death, and you shall be executed according to law. Judge Kaufman is sentencing these defendants to death for treason, even though they were neither charged with nor convicted of treason. What makes it worse is, that between the verdict and the sentencing, the judge met secretly with the prosecutors and discussed the death penalty, even though a judge is never supposed to meet with one side without the other being present. Kaufman gives Morton Sobel the maximum sentence of 30 years, based on Max Elicher's testimony connecting him to the Rosenbergs. But no evidence connects him directly to stealing the secret of the atomic bomb. I was hoping that I might get only 20 years but then when I got 30, it, 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 I accepted it as, I wasn't surprised at it. The next day, despite Prosecutor Irving Sapol's plea for a light sentence because of the Greenglass's cooperation, Kaufman gives David Greenglass 15 years in prison. 
a shocked Ruth Greenglass nearly collapses. May 15, 1951. Sing Sing Prison in Ossining, New York, 30 miles outside of New York City. The Rosenbergs are on death row. Julius and Ethel are permitted to visit together for one hour a week. The brief encounters help sustain them, along with their frequent exchange of letters. Ethel writes, Hello, Julie dearest. Since Wednesday and all the good sweet words that pass between us, I have been walking on air. My dear one, rest easy. I am ever fortified in your love. My dearest Ethel, our spirit is good and hopes for a successful appeal are based on solid ground. Given an even chance under law, we must win. Adorable wife, we're pulling hard, but the reward is great. Keep it up. Your own, Julie. The appeal process is well underway when the Rosenberg's two sons are brought to Sing Sing for a visit. It is the first time Michael and Robert have seen their parents in more than a year. I'd have no memories of all, at all of my parents uh, if I had not visited them in prison. And I remember the place, Sing Sing, as being this gray, for, forbidding place. Uh, but, you know, the family was reunited. We were happy. My parents wanted to make sure that uh, we were reassured. And uh, they succeeded, at least in fooling me. After finally seeing her beloved children, Ethel is overcome with emotion. It is only the beginning of a series of dramatic highs and lows. For over two years, defense attorney Emanuel Block pleads their case, while Rosenberg supporters organize a worldwide campaign to save their lives. More than 20 appeals are presented to the federal courts. All are denied. They argued unsuccessfully that their death sentences were unconstitutional, that the Communist Party membership evidence prejudiced the jury against them, that there was no corroboration of Greenglass's testimony, and that the judge was biased against them. The Rosenbergs are scheduled to die on June 18, 1953, their 14th wedding anniversary. Then, on June 17th, as the Supreme Court adjourns for the summer recess, a final stay of execution is granted by Justice William O. Douglas. What Douglas didn't know was that the day before, the Attorney General had met secretly with the Chief Justice and agreed that if Douglas granted a stay, the entire court would meet and overturn that stay. Thursday, June 18th, in a history-making special session, the Supreme Court reconvenes from its summer recess. The next day, on June 19th, the court votes six to three to overrule the stay of execution. The Rosenbergs are scheduled to die that night. This was an extremely important and complicated question, and yet it was decided in only 12 hours. So fast that three justices who were dissenting said it happened too quickly. But in that manner, the last remaining judicial barrier to execution for the Rosenbergs was swept away. Now, only the president can grant clemency. Over 200,000 letters have poured into the White House. Tens of thousands of Rosenberg supporters rally on two continents. Pope Pius XII and Albert Einstein are among those asking for mercy. But mounting public pressure and demonstrations outside the White House failed to move President Dwight D. Eisenhower. At Sing Sing, Julius Rosenberg is offered a commutation of the death sentence in exchange for a full confession. His reply, human dignity is not for sale. With little time left, the Rosenbergs prepare a final letter to their sons. Ethel writes, We wish we might have had the tremendous joy and gratification of living our lives out with you. Your daddy, who was with me in these last momentous hours, sends his heart and all the love that is in it for his dearest boys. Always remember that we were innocent and could not wrong our conscience. We press you close and kiss you with all our strength. Lovingly, Daddy and Mommy. As Julius and Ethel Rosenberg spend their final hours on death row, 
Thousands assemble for a final vigil in New York's Union Square. In the crowd is Ronald Radosh. There was great despair, great sorrow uh, at this event. It seemed that it all, because nobody in that crowd at least, believed that they would really be executed. Somehow they all believed at the last minute this execution would be lifted. At Sing Sing, over 30 newspaper reporters gather for the executions. A direct phone line to FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover is set up in the warden's office in case the Rosenbergs decide to make a last minute confession. Waiting in Washington for word on the open line is Assistant Prosecutor James Kilsheimer. Well, I personally never thought that the uh, Rosenberg were talk at that point. They had the keys to the, their uh, death cell in their pocket if they wanted to uh, use them, which they decided not to do. 8 p.m., execution time. Julius is the first to be taken to the electric chair. After the standard three shocks, Julius Rosenberg is pronounced dead at 8.06 p.m. He was 35 years old. As Ethel takes her final journey to the death chamber, she declares to the prison matrons, we are the first victims of American fascism. The first shocks fail to kill Ethel. She is re-strapped to the chair and given two more before being pronounced dead. She was 37 years old. I prefer not to bemoan my parents' fate. June 19th for me is a time to celebrate their lives and their resistance. I think bitterness serves no purpose. Uh, I think someone once said that the best revenge is living a good life and that's what I try to do. The execution of the Rosenbergs leaves many with a question. Were they really guilty? Four decades later, in July of 1995, the National Security Agency releases 49 partially decoded secret Soviet cables intercepted by the United States during the Rosenberg era. The Venona cables, as they are called, clearly implicate Julius Rosenberg. They prove that Julius Rosenberg was an agent of the KGB, that he was recruiting others, that his wife was aware of what he was doing. All the details are in there. And yet, there is no confirmation from Moscow. Over the years, the Soviets have denied the Rosenbergs' guilt and refused to make public their intelligence files. Then, in March 1997, a former Soviet spymaster suddenly steps forward. I was an intelligence officer of New York Intelligence Station, and Julius Rosenberg was one of my agents. Alexander Faklisov, a retired KGB colonel, confirms his role as the link between Moscow and Julius Rosenberg, and says they met in New York at least 50 times between 1943 and 1946. He calls Julius Rosenberg a hero, a true revolutionary, willing to sacrifice himself for his beliefs. I cannot prove that Feklisov is making up his story. I cannot prove that these Venona transcriptions are either cooked or fake. Uh, there could be some truth there. While Feklisov credits Julius Rosenberg with helping to organize an espionage ring and handing over top secret information on military electronics, he insists Ethel Rosenberg never had any direct contact with Soviet intelligence. Ethel never worked for us. She didn't do anything. The fact that she was imprisoned, that she was subjected to emotional torture for several years, and that she was executed is a terrible blot on our jurisprudence. Faklisov also says, as the Venona Cables suggested, that Rosenberg's role in atomic espionage was minor. He maintains that the rough sketch of the lens mold Rosenberg gave to the Soviet Union was useful, but not significant. All the recent material demonstrates the central fraud in my parents' case. Did they steal the secret of the atomic bomb? Because that, make no mistake about it, is why they were killed. Uh, and the answer is no. They did not steal the secret of the uh, 
atomic bomb. Other top-level physicists did that. But if they could have, they would have. So I think they were guilty. Now, I agree, the death sentence was inexcusable and was a crime in itself and was morally wrong and should never have taken place. But the Rosenbergs were not innocent. As for the other members of the Rosenberg spy ring, Harry Gold, the Philadelphia chemist and Soviet courier, served 16 years of his 30-year prison sentence. Gold was released in 1966 and died in 1972 at the age of 60. David Greenglass, Ethel Rosenberg's brother, was sentenced to 15 years. He served 10. Today, he and his wife Ruth live under an assumed name. They declined to be interviewed for this documentary. Morton Sobel was released from prison in 1969 and today lives in San Francisco. He served 18 and a half years of his 30-year sentence, the first five and a half in Alcatraz. Sobel, who is not identified in the Venona cables, maintains his and the Rosenberg's innocence. People today cannot be idealistic the way we were. Okay, we chose the Soviet Union to be idealistic about it. it turned out to be wrong. But I would rather have been idealistic and wrong as, as, rather than growing up without any, uh, any, any place to grab and to try to do something about. I think of Julie and Ethel very much. They are remembered. As for the Rosenberg sons, Robert and Michael Mirapol have spent much of their adult lives trying to prove their father and mother were unjustly convicted and killed. We have this rush to judgment, this rush to execute people, uh, and we're so convinced that they're guilty. And history teaches us that over and over again, sometimes we're right and sometimes we're wrong, and once you kill people, you can't take it back.